Italian wine is just like the Italians. They're incredibly creative and imaginative. And it's not by chance that they excel in cuisine, in fashion, in design. Gucci, Versace, cars. Yeah. They're completely individualistic and fragmented. Is that a history of kingdoms? I don't know, but Italians are incredibly individualistic. So that means that you have so many denominations and so many different grapes. So we're talking about 600 odd grapes and 400 plus denominations. Denominations meaning little regions or designations yeah, within the regions. Appellations. Yeah, the Yeah. So that is very difficult to wrap your head around when you are a wine lover. And that's one of the reasons we've been making small booklets to make it a little bit more digestible and approachable. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 183. How can you learn more about the diverse regions and styles of Italian wine? What's the difference in impact between wine competitions and critic scores? And how do they influence the wines you buy and drink? You'll hear those stories and more in our chat with Stevie Kim, the managing director of Vinitaly International, the world's largest trade show. Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much. I love reading the ways famous authors keep themselves writing. Thomas Hardy roped himself to a chair. Ernest Hemingway ended each day's session with a sentence to start the next day. While I don't equate myself at all with those greats, I do have my own techniques to keep writing. I make a calendar appointment with myself every morning that I don't miss any more than I wouldn't miss a meeting with someone else. That's also when my brain is most creative. On days I don't feel like writing, I do less creative tasks, like organizing my notes or editing what I've already written. The point is to make that morning session sacred. What are your techniques for doing what's most important in your work life? Let me know. Maybe there's a tip I can use. As promised, I'll share a beta reader review with you now. This one is from Lori Hausman from Niagara, Ontario. Quote, three words, good for her. Really, really enjoyed the read. Adore her writing style. Love, love all the comparisons and metaphors throughout. Comfy visualizations. Appreciate positive role modeling and advocating for women. Respect her bravery and honesty. Lots of meaning takeaways for me. Four stars. Thank you, Lori. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 183. This is where I share more behind the scenes of the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. Okay, on with the show. Stevie Kim was born in Korea and was raised in the United States, where she attended New York University. After moving to Verona, Italy, she obtained an MBA from, she can correct me on this, Bocconi University. Bocconi. Bocconi. Thank you, Stevie. In Italian, the C's are hard, the two C's together. Good lesson. You're already imparting your wisdom. All right, good. (laughs) Later, she had postgraduate specialization in wealth management at the Wharton School, very prestigious, at the University of Pennsylvania. She's currently studying for her WSET diploma in wine. As managing director of Vinitaly International, Stevie has launched and now manages social media and educational platforms to promote the world's largest wine trade show. 
In 2017, she launched the Italian Wine Podcast, which is now past its 770th episode. Wow. As well as the Jumbo Shrimp Guide to Italian Wine and International Grape Varieties of Italy, as well as the Mama Jumbo Shrimp YouTube channel and various media outlets associated with that brand. Welcome, Stevie. I am so glad to have you here with us. Ciao, Natalie. Ciao, Ciao. a tutti. <laughs> I love that. How's your Italian? What's the opposite of bueno? <laughs> Movesio? <laughs> yeah, male. Male. Yeah. Macho male. So <laughs> this is the end of the Italian segment of this oh, I podcast. thought there was supposed going to be an Italian. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> you got the wrong memo. Already. <laughs> All right. So, Stevie, before we dive into wine, let's find out a little bit more about you. You grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where you were a cheerleader in high school. Is oh, my God. You've always I'm, been... No, no, stop, stop. <laughs> where did you get this? Where did you get this stuff? Nobody knows this stuff. <laughs> I have people out there. St- no, just kidding. I don't want to make you paranoid at the beginning. I do my research. So were you or were you not a cheerleader in high school? Okay, I confess to that. But that was like schoolions of years ago when I was in high school. I mean, you're an advocate. You're always outgoing, even in high school? I suppose. If I were to choose between an introvert and extrovert, definitely more leaning towards the X. Cool. All right. So is that how you happen to meet your husband, who I understand is Veronese, (laughs) D-O-C-G? He is very much Veronese. And I went to Brooklyn Tech, and he was nowhere near that. So, okay. no, I met him here. Do you really want me to tell the story? It's not that original. That's okay. I love love stories. So I was on my sabbatical. I was working for Pricewaterhouse. It kind of dates me, obviously, because it was only Pricewaterhouse. And I took a year off because I don't know about in Canada, but in stateside, you really get just two weeks of holidays a year. So I used to come every year to Europe and in particular Italy, because I just love Dolce Vita, you know, and I had friends here, but I just thought two weeks wasn't enough. So I took a year off and then I went sailing for two months in Greece with some professional sailors from Austria. That was actually the last of my sailing career, by the way, parentheses. That sounds beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then I met my husband because in theory, he's a doctor, medical doctor. No, actually, that's kind of a crazy story because in Italy, everyone is a dottore or dottoressa if you have a college degree. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's kind of confusing. So whereas in stateside, can you say doctor for medical doctors? So anyways, to make a very long story short, he is a medical doctor and he specializes in eating disorders and obesity. So he started the first inpatient treatment in Italy for that and cognitive behavioral therapy. So that is the reason I'm here. And the reason I met him because a friend of mine who owned a language school, she tapped me because she said, I have this doctor. He has to do his first presentation in Cambridge and Oxford, and his English is a bit lackluster. He had never presented in English before. So it was just kind of a favor I was doing for my friend. And that's when I met him. So you're helping him with his presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. You went over there. It's not that original. You know, I took fully advantage of, you know, my professorship for that moment. And then that's it. That was it pretty much. Oh, wow. So you traveled to Verona to help him with his presentation? Is that how it worked? No, no, I was already. Oh, you were already there? Yeah, I was already in Europe. And I stopped in Verona because, you know, the world is wonderful because when I was working at Price Waterhouse, my best friend was going out with this Italian girl from Verona. So we all became friends. He discovered he was gay afterwards, and that was tragic for her, but, you know, whatever. So that was kind of his outing. But he introduced me to this Veronese community, and I stopped in Verona. That was kind of the reason. Oh, wow. Well, Verona is the city of love and tragedy, you know, Romeo and Juliet with the balcony and everything. So you're right on theme, right on brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's great. And so did you also create a program for him as well to train doctors? on obesity and 
eating disorder? So to make a very long story skinny, I decided to stay in Verona because I think in general, women are much more adaptable and they have much more skills to adapt to a new environment. Whereas, first of all, he was a medical doctor. He couldn't practice in New York, for example, right? So it was easier for me to stay. And also what I believed, what he was doing is very innovative and important. So I said, how can I help him? How can I help this man? So I started a publishing house and I started doing books about eating disorders, mostly self-help books. I've translated some of them and I had him write a couple of books. But, you know, Italians, they're like the last place in terms of readership amongst Western countries, I believe. It's really sad, you know. You know how in like I I grew up in New York and when you go to New York or any place, everyone has a book, you know, they're reading in the subway or wherever you go. It's not like that here. Everyone is reading like, you know, it was before Internet and they were reading, you know, like the sports magazines or whatnot. Oh, that surprises me because Dante is Italy, the father of literature. The crazy thing is the very few who read, they read a lot. So they kind of make up for it. So like this. Sounds like the wine industry, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually kind of similar. And so I said, why don't I do some courses? Because it was their self-help books. So they were both for the therapist as well as the patient. So I said, why don't we train the doctors And so that doctors and psychologists so that they can use basically the books. I was doing a course based on the books, how to use the books. And it became hugely popular. So I started the first master's program in the medical field for eating disorders, for cognitive behavioral treatment. Wow. So you've always been into teaching and sharing knowledge. So I can see the threads coming together in your current career. Do you remember the first memorable Italian wine you tasted? You know, I mean, paradoxically, I grew up in New York and I didn't really have access to wine until I started working. And then there were like business lunches and there were basically, I hate to say it, but Bordeaux blends or champagne. Those are kind of the two things. I think we're kind of the same generation, I can say. Yes. So back then, Italian wines weren't considered as prestigious as now. And I think the technology has advanced so much, especially in the winemaking and the vineyard management. Now, every Italian wine is basically good, right? But I couldn't have said that in the past. So I hadn't really been exposed to Italian wine until I would say in a significant way until I moved to Italy. Right. And so was there a bottle or a wine that sort of said to you, oh my gosh, this wine is great. So first of all, when you move to Italy, you've been to Italy, yes, obviously, I have. right? Yes. So in Europe in general, the wines, I'm not saying they're super cheap, but yes, they are very affordable when you compare it to New York, for instance. And what I'm talking about is very good quality wine. So Verona is between, for your audience, I don't know what your audience is like, but it's between geographically located right in the middle between Milan and Venice. And it's near this lake called Lago di Garda. And near there, it was summer months. And I was exposed to this drink called, I had my first glass of Chiaretto Baldolino, which is a rosé wine. Ah, okay. So even the concept of rosé wine was not something that just was really, I didn't have a huge, I would say, expertise or knowledge or had tasted a lot of rosé wines. I mean, in America, there was this huge thing with the Matus, you know, oh, yes. you know that funky bottle. Tried to forget that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that was <laughs> the only thing I knew about rosé because Provence wasn't that big as it is now. So I tried the Chiarete and I was like, it was summer and it was just so refreshing. Right. So I said, you know what? I kind of could get used to this. And then... In Italy, you can also purchase wine at supermarkets. So then I grabbed a few bottles and I was like, this is delicious. Hmm. So that's kind of like how I started paradoxically with the rosé wine in Italy. But I live in a wine country. So, of course, I live near Suave, Valpolicella. I mean, there's and not very far is Trento and Franciacorta. So, yeah, everything is accessible. Wow. It sounds like a wine lover's candy store. Just (laughs) sounds amazing. 
So let's talk about Vin Italy. When did that start? It's it's quite historic. What is it and when did it start? Obviously, I think it's headquartered in Verona where you are. So tell us more about that. So it started, believe it or not, this will be the upcoming Vin Italy will be the 54th edition, 5-4. And that's, if you consider, we didn't do it for two editions. So 2019 was the last edition. And then because of COVID, right. uh, just the nature of the exhibition business, we had postponed it until this year. And it's going to happen in April. Oh, so you're going full-fledged, full-forward, in-person. Yeah, so 56 years it's been going on. Wow. Crazy. That is crazy. Have you been? I have not. No, not yet. Oh, my God. What's going on? You have to come over. I think I even invited you to be a judge. You haven't. Uh, you couldn't, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you've done your job, but I'm just a bit of a hermit. But yeah, no, it intrigues me. But tell me first about COVID. How did you adapt it, to use the overused word pivot? I mean, did you just do everything online? I mean, how did that go? Well, first of all, I run a media agency. So yes, we do event management and most people see me with a glass of wine and, you know, doing events. But what we really do is communication. So it really depended on your category, but the communication business was considered essential. So I never had to close up the office. And let me tell you, that was kind of, I think, a savior, a godsend, because we had about 40 people in my team. And Italian culture is all about the aperitivo culture, especially the younger generation, right? So the fact that all the bars were closed and the restaurants and all the social gatherings, it created a lot of stress, especially with my team. So basically, I didn't have to close up the office, but with social distancing, if, when you come, you will realize... I have a huge office. It's 2,000 square meters. It's open space. So we were able to socially distance and I basically had an open bar. So that kind of kept everybody safe. Okay. In a way, yeah. paradoxically. So, I mean, there's so much wine here. So I think that really helped us to cement the team. One of the things that I've done, which I've implemented was to accelerate all of our digital products and services. So like the podcast, when we started in 2017, like, you know, I, when did you stop? End of 2018. Yeah. So we started in 2017. We only had 23,000 listens, right? We used to do two episodes a week. We used to record two times a year and just like dole out all the episodes. And then during the lockdown, we used to use Zoom, but did you use Zoom before the pandemic? Yeah, I did. I think you and I were like very few amongst the Zoom. <laughs> well, I came from the world of high tech. So yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Right, right. So with the Zoom and everything, we accelerated all of our activities. We transformed them into a digital platform. So we started doing four times a year and now we're up to seven to nine episodes a week. So it's become almost like a radio. Yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of things to do. And I created also a TikTok channel. So Mama Jumbo Shrimp, so that it was kind of a team building in a way so that I didn't want people to go crazy because the nature of our agency work was such that we used to travel all over the world. And a lot of, especially the millennials, the Gen Zs, they love to work for our company because they got a chance to travel with us. We had a rather significant expanded entourage. And because they couldn't travel, they were absolutely climbing the walls. So we created more activities for them like TikTok, all the different, even the dances, yes. <laughs> and I discovered this new technology, which is called automobile, like a car. So we actually drove and we went into different winery regions to visit in Italy, which we hadn't done. And that's how we started also doing some videos. We were documenting, um, interviewing producers. And so, yes. And then everything else, we had a hybrid format. So whether it's the wine competition, whether it's the wine business conference, whether it was the tastings, of course, we started doing the mini bottles. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. For so, samples, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Cool. Okay. So you've done that. 
But let's go back to the Italy itself, the sort of what it was and is. How many producers attend when it's fully fledged, like in person? kind of event? So this year, we will be back to having about 4,000 producers. Wow. Okay. And attendees? Yeah. We're not talking about just like little booths. Okay. We're talking about like huge, huge live. Sometimes there are castles, so some some there are buildings. Actually, their booth is a castle. Like, what does that look like? It looks like a miniaturized castle on different floors. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you have to come to actually see this in person to really get the look and feel of what Vinitaly is all about. Sure. Oh my gosh. And how many people attend? In the past, they've gone as many as 150,000. Wow. Yeah. And there was a good number of also like the quote unquote, the wine lovers. Now the organization has scaled back a bit and actually on the end of March, the Italian state was to lift the state of the emergency status, but it's been just extended till end of April. So because Vinitaly will happen from the 10th to the 13th of April, the social distancing and the mass mandating will still be in effect. So probably about that will go down to hopefully about 90,000 in four days. Still a lot of people. And you said the wine lovers. So there's the consumers, but then there's what we call the trade, which is writers or media, the restaurant buyers who buy wines, sommeliers and so on. So is it still an event where consumers would get something out of it by tasting of the workshops? First of all, the consumers are allowed to enter just on Sunday now. Okay. So they can only come on Sunday. And then there is another event called Vinitaly in the City. So everything happens. There's kind of a sprawl of different booths and different events happening in the city of Verona, which will showcase wine as well, dedicated to the consumer Ah. so that they don't have to come into the exhibition halls. Right. That's kind of a compromise. Oh, that makes sense too. Like I think the consumer experience would be better at a restaurant anyway, because the trade shows can be overwhelming if you're not a professional who's out there to taste 30 wines or whatever while spitting, of course, whatever their goals are. And so how large is Vinitaly itself physically? Like if you were to compare it to football fields or something. Yeah. So I know you guys are into like, I can't remember what the feet or the yards or whatever that is, but it's 150,000 square meters. Okay. I'm just trying to equate that. Yeah. So like how much is a like a football stadium. I would not know that. I am not a sports person. I think someone told me it might be around seven, 8,000 square meters. So that would mean it's about, at least the net size would be about 15 times as much. And then the- 15 football fields. Yeah, 15 like football stadiums. And then- Holy smokes. The gross would be actually more like 20. Oh my gosh. Wow. So it's huge. And you can't understand it until you come here. So you got to come. Well, I will. I will. I think I need a game plan though, speaking of how big that is, because I mean, where do people start? I guess they make appointments and have an agenda of who they want to see. And Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is primarily a B2B event. Business, business. Yeah. Right. So it's based on appointments and, you know, it's been going on for 54, 56 years. So there is a long tradition of kind of a place to be seen and place to do business. So, you know, of course, things have changed since the pandemic, but it is very much a place to be if you are into Italian wine. Of course. Yes. Well, it reminds me of the book fairs like in London and Frankfurt. I mean, it's just where people go to sell and make deals and all the rest of it, if you're in the book trade. What is opera wine? Tell us about that. So opera wine is the kind of the premier opening event to Vinitaly. And what I mean by that is when I first started, actually, I started this with Wine Spectator. And I asked them, can we do something like wine experience. Have you been to wine experience in New York? I have in New York City. It's amazing. Like all the prestigious winemakers are there and you can taste and workshops and yeah. So it's exactly like wine experience and wine experience. You have 300 wineries from all over the world and we work with the same team, but we just do it for Italian wines and it's hundred wineries 
We just had our 10th anniversary. And this year we'll have 130 wineries. And it's the principles. They choose one wine and their library wines it is very much a kind of the sexy and glamorous opening to Vinitaly. It usually happens in the heart of Santa, not at the pavilion, but because of the pandemic and social distancing regulation, we have a big space, but a beautiful, more like an industrial space, but very beautiful space just in front of the exhibition center. Oh, okay. Did it used to take place in a Coliseum type thing or? Yeah, kind of like just in front of the Colosseum in the heart of center. You've been to Verona, right? Yes, I went to the balcony. There's yep. a Colosseum and there is a building just in front of okay. it. And we used to do it in the front. And because of the pandemic, you know, situation, we couldn't have a bunch of people in the same space, in a tight space like sure, that. Sure, sure. Okay. So you get all the rock stars showing up, like Angela Gaia and all that? Yeah, yeah. Angela will not be joining us, but yeah, we have like Piero Antinori, all the principles behind the stands. And it's actually a really fun moment also for the producers because they get a chance to see each other. And especially now, I did actually do the opera wine in June. We did kind of a, it was a smaller version, but we did a celebration edition, celebratory edition for the 10th edition in June. So we kind of had a makeup edition ad hoc in June of last year. So, but it will take place the day before. And we used to have like really the crazy rock stars coming from all over the world, from China, from Singapore in their private jets and crazy stuff like that. Wow. But of course, you know, now Asia is, you know, because of their quarantine measures still, And of course, now Russia. That was a big market for you before, wasn't it? Yeah, huge, huge market for Italian wine. You know, it's a crazy situation now. Yeah, with the things going on with Ukraine. You host a wine competition. And I'm curious about that because there are many wine competitions around the world. Obviously, you believe in it. But what do you think are the differences between wine competitions and seeing the medals for consumers buying wine versus scores given from critics? Do you think they're of equal weight or what is your opinion? I think there are different things. So let me tell you the one big difference between our competition. It's really called a selection because it's not a competition because it goes into a guidebook. We select the wines, any wine that is 90 points and above, it gets included in the guide. But the best bit is that these wines, you should appreciate this, you're a geek. So with the Beacon, we insert it into the catalog and on the app. So the competition, the selection happens a few days before. So we then install all of the awardees into the app, into the catalog, so that when a buyer goes nearby, then it gets alerted, like awardees are in this area with the wines. So it's just another tool. I don't see it as, you know, all or nothing kind of situation, but I do see as an additional value add to help promote the Italian wine producers. It's pretty simple. So do you give out like gold, silver, bronze medals, or is it just every wine that gets 90 or above? Yeah, so it's not gold, silver, and bronze. It's just five stars. Okay. Any 90 and above receive the five star status. Okay, so it's not ranking these wines. No, it's just everybody. No. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because the criticism of some wine competitions, which is not exactly how yours is structured, is that everybody who enters goes home with a prize, like kindergarten <laughs> or something. Well, I have the other problem, the other side, the other spectrum, rather, because we don't give out too many five stars. So the producers will participate and then they don't get 90 points, then they kind of fizzle off in a way. So that's another problem I have to address. So we're exactly the opposite. Like opposite of most wine competitions. Some of the yeah, competitions give out You know, like it's everybody very generous with their awards. Whereas we have in the beginning, the first edition was horrible. It was only 13%. So it was the mess. Okay. Everyone was calling me. I don't want to talk to you anymore. You know, what do you, what's going on? (laughs) They're calling me. I don't want to talk to you. (laughs) You know, we've received, you know, gold medals from here and there. And what do you guys think you are? You know, blah, 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 blah. 
So then now we're kind of up to like, I think like 23, 24%. Hmm. That is a low pass rate, so to speak. I know, That's I know. Admirable I know. in terms of selectivity. So from a consumer's perspective, yeah. But we really wanted to make a difference, right? Because a foreigner comes and I mean, the choices of wine during Venetuli, it, they're so vast, it's overwhelming, right? So we want to help them identify perhaps some new wines that they can take into consideration with these added value and so forth. Sure, sure. And that sort of ties into my next question. I mean, it, Italian wine is so vast. It's also complex. Like, Why is it so complex, Italian wine? I mean, at least for us in North America, what is it about it? Italian wine is just like the Italians. They're incredibly creative and imaginative. And it's not by chance that they excel in you know, cuisine, in fashion, in design. True. Right, Gucci, Versace. Yeah, but cars. they're exactly yeah. like the Italians in a way that they're completely individualistic and fragmented. Is that a history of kingdoms? Like it was a collection of kingdoms or whatever, and they were all... You know, I can't tell you because maybe Attilio Scienza, who's our scientific director, he knows everything. He's like walking Wikipedia of vine genetics and vine history, but I don't know. But I don't know what the deal is, but Italians are incredibly individualistic. So that means that you have so many denomination and so many different grapes, right? So we're talking about 600 odd grapes and, you know, 400 plus denominations. Denominations meaning little regions or designations yeah, within the regions. Appellations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that is very difficult to navigate and wrap your head around when you are just a wine lover, wine enthusiast, right? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why we've been working to train highly specialized experts through the Vinital International Academy program and making small little booklets so that they can like into bite sizes so that we can help the wine lovers to make it a little bit more digestible and approachable. Sure. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Stevie. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I was fascinated with her points on the differences in impact between wine competitions and critic scores. They really do have quite a bit of influence on the wines we drink and buy. Two, the range and diversity of Italian regions and wine styles can seem overwhelming, but I love Stevie's approach to making them accessible and, importantly, memorable. And three, I've added several more obscure Italian wines to my list to try next. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with Stevie, links to her podcast and website, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcleancom forward slash 183. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or want to become a beta reader of my new memoir at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. You won't want to miss next week when we continue our chat with Stevie. In the meantime, if you missed episode 164, go back and take a listen. I chat about Southern Italy's wine, food, and flavor with author Robert Camuto. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Wine back in the day wasn't something that it is now. It was an accompaniment. It wasn't the star of the table. When you look at Southern Italy, there's so many darn flavors there and so much delicious, spicy food and fresh tomatoes, peppers, greens, artichokes. Maybe it's a little more difficult for wine to be the standout star of that. Because the flavors are so intense. There's so much else going on at the table. So much other intensity. Everybody loves Burgundy. But what does one eat in Burgundy? There's some nice Boeuf Bourguignon. There's some nice snails. But it's not the same thing as having pasta with sea urchins and clams and peppers and all the different sauces. They drank it as a food, as a very simple pairing, and did not savor wine to the extent that we do today.
If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a full-bodied Italian red wine. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.